Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Uh, tonight's presentation is by Brian Odom on the Messier Marathon. Brian shot all the Messier objects in one night. Uh, but before we get into that, I do want to point out our image of the week by Stephen Doye. And unfortunately, Stephen wasn't able to make it. Uh, we kind of rushed this one. and uh, Trust me, we have good things to come with this image of the day. But I'm going to show off his photo now. Uh, oh, my goodness. I do not have it. So I, I apologize for this. Let me... Pull it up right here. Let's see. There we go. And Stephen did a solar shot that I believe you can see now, um, solar H alpha shot. And uh, I can't give you many of the details. I hadn't heard back from him, but congratulations, Stephen. It's a great image. Uh, the sun has been very active in the last month or so uh, with some really cool stuff going on. Uh, so thanks for contributing that photograph. Um, everyone remember you can post your images for submission on our Google Plus page and I did recently post a new event as they call it so you could go in there and just post them and uh, we'll, we'll show them off and everybody gets to look at them there anyway so you're just sharing your photos. Um, but for right now I'm just going to pass it over to, actually I'm going to take back my screen and then I'm going to pass it back over to Brian Odom who's going to take over and Brian you're welcome to take over now. All right well um, I'm gonna tell the story about staying up all night and I'm getting old so I don't do this very often so it's a kind of a, an interesting story and um, but I, I'm just going to go through what we did, how we did it, a little background of the equipment we used, and uh, and then. But along the way, I want to make sure that that you folks uh, uh, ask questions. So I hope to pause, and and I love questions. I love uh, heckling, and I I love. Uh, whatever you want to, to ask because uh, if I'm just talking out into space then uh, then that's not a very good idea. Um, so who, who was this Charles Messier guy? Well you know it's the 1700s uh, uh, he was a comet hunter and um, somebody had told me when I was young that he was a comet hunter for the king and that's why the king wanted him to catch comets and then to be glorified. Well uh, that's not the case. Uh, he was just doing it as an astronomer so uh, he was looking for comets in the 1700s with a four, four inch telescope and uh, when you're a comet hunter you look for little fuzzy patches but they have to move and so he came across these fuzzy patches that don't move and they were false alarms pain in the butt so he decided to catalog them and he cataloged dozens and dozens over his lifetime and uh, the catalog was actually expanded I just found out in the 40s and 50s and so it's a total of 110 and so now uh, that it's there's 110 and so in the March and early April time frame we here in the northern hemisphere we can actually try to see all 110 so in my lifetime I've seen a uh, hundred is my best ever in one night so um, that was my best ever, and uh, and then uh, trying to do this uh, with a, a camera was something I was trying to to, uh, to do, and uh, I got this remote control observatory, and uh, so it got me the idea of trying to do it all in one night, and it took a team of five people, and you will see their names as we go through this, and uh, we couldn't have done this alone. And as I was planning, then I came across Alex McConaughey's uh, his uh, uh, doing it all in one night imaging uh, that preceded me by about three or four years. So that was uh, it was fantastic to see that. And so it's definitely, uh, I'm not the first. And uh, Alex's wonderful article in Sky and Telescope magazine, I believe it was in April of uh, 14 was very useful in my uh, planning here. So uh, any questions that have come up along the way just Alex or whoever or is it going to be um, Adam whoever wants to feed them to me but what I would figure I was do here is first give you a, a clue into is the telescope that we use to do this. I live in Michigan and um, in Michigan uh, it's cloudy all the time. 
And if you want to do a Messier marathon, it's going to be cloudy. I mean, that's just my experience. But we've done visuals over the years. So uh, recently, I, you, do I hear a question? Not a question yet, but I do uh, I do see a lot of people in the room. Guys, ask your questions in Q&A, please. Uh, Brian requested as many questions as possible, so don't hesitate. Thank Love you. questions, because if you got a question, I'm sure there's five other people with the same question. So ask away. So um, uh, about a year and a half ago, um, myself and Stan Watson, another astronomer here uh, with me in Michigan, uh, assemb uh, assembled a remote control observatory down at that red star. And that is down at the border of New Mexico and Arizona, about 40 miles north of the New of Mexico border. And so it's called Rancho Hidalgo. And I'm going to give you just a little bit of uh, detail. This is uh, about two years ago. You see, it's just a desert. There's nothing there. It's just a, a, a desert with a floor of, of uh, scrub. You can see we have a roll-off roof. It rolls off onto those trestles. This is a very large telescope. It's uh, one of stands coming in the building. It's a plane wave. Um, I would definitely uh, hold my breath if I was watching that when it happened. Uh, these are the two scopes that were uh, installed. Uh, the two big ones here you can see on the left and on the right. Those are stands. Those are not mine. Um, there's a 24-inch plane wave on the left and a 17-inch plane wave on the right. And you earlier saw the computer room, which is just behind me in this picture. And my scope is on the far end there. You can see it on the tall uh, platform there. And uh, you can see that we have some reflective uh, material on the roof to uh, reflect some of the heat because it gets hot there. And you don't want to have heat inside. So uh, it reflects some of that heat. Uh, this is a better shot of my scope. And uh, this is the scope we use for the all-night Messier Marathon. There's my selfie picture there. And What's interesting about this telescope it is, is it's quite modest compared to most people who do a remote control observatory. This is a 10-inch reflector, 10-inch reflector F5. It started its life in Taiwan as a Dob Dobsonian telescope. So it was just a Dob, and, uh, but it was uh, purchased and pimped out, uh, modified, optimized, for photography uh, by a gentleman who sold telescopes here in Michigan. And so it's got uh, a, a refigured mirror, a bigger secondary, you know, stuff like that to make it better for photography. As you can see, I have a, a finder scope on top or a uh, auto guiding telescope. The guiding telescope is a four inch refractor. And I have the wonderful Orion Starshoot auto guider, the silver disc. You can see on the on that uh, four-inch refractor. That's my auto guider, and it's a Paramount mount MX. So that's the small one. If you want to see an ME, that's what you see on the right on that bigger plane wave scope on the right-hand side. And uh, there's lots of wires and cables, and uh, you know that's kind of a, the difficult thing to start up w when you have an, a new observatory. And it's been a year and a half now, and it's took a, quite a bit of time. Uh, but what made it easier was I had everything set up in my backyard in Michigan for six months before I installed it there. And uh, so that's really important uh, to try to do these things before uh, before you, you get out there and try to do it under the dark sky. You'll never get it all to work right. As you can see in the background here, there's a telescope uh, observatory being constructed. And uh, there are... Uh, nearly a dozen of these observatories now in this Rancho Hidalgo area and the landlord lives just a uh, hundred yards away so in his front yard he's got these 10 remote control telescopes uh, that's my cooler box because the camera heats up the desert is hot cameras don't like hot if you try to take pictures with the camera at 80 degrees or more, you are not going to have good pictures. So I just made a thermoelectric cooler 
box that you can see plans on the internet. Uh, happy to provide any details to that to people who want to know more about that. Uh, you can see um, the scope here. I'm not going to get into it. We might be able to take a look at a live shot of, uh, of the opening of the dome here um, in a little bit. But uh, th when we uh, got started a year ago, this is the first picture I took. Uh, it was about an hour's exposure. Um, I probably over-processed this, but uh, you know, for my first shot, I was very happy with that. Um, this is not an impressive shot, but it's just cool. Centaurus A appears only five degrees above the southern horizon because we're down near Mexico. So that's kind of cool. It's, it's, uh, from what I understand, Centaurus A, A is one galaxy eating another one. Uh, and this is a, a shot of the, the Rosette Nebula, and I'm very excited about that. The field of view of the telescope is about one degree tall, one and a half degree wide. And it's a Canon camera. It's a full frame 5D Mark III camera. And as you can see, because it's so red, it is a modified camera, modified by HuTech. More recently, uh, we had some uh, rework to the telescopes, heading to uh, remove them. As you can see, this is a uh, kind of an exciting trip uh, out of the dome with the nice plane wave and it was uh, being shipped off to get a new mirror and uh, Stan is expecting it back here in uh, just a few weeks back into the dome and to get that back up and running and uh, so that was kind of an exciting time this was kind of fun because it was a, a shot not that impressive the Trifid Nebula but if you look at the inset that's the the, the Hubble shot and you see the little antenna and those little spiky things with the star being born at the tips, you can actually see that in my image. And so I was pretty excited because I only have a 50-inch focal length. This is a pretty modest telescope, like I said, and it only has a 50-inch focal length. Uh, this is M83. Uh, I think I posted this on Cloudy Nights a few months ago. Um, this is a, a pretty surprising shot. I was really excited about this. Um, that's a really good resolution considering it's a reflector it's not a refractor and um, and it's it's a, a very modest telescope like I said so this is M13 what's really cool is that you can see that uh, the NGC galaxy at the bottom and a tiny little NGC that's halfway in between that galaxy at the bottom and then M13 so that's that and if, if uh, you have interest I just started because my my 22-year-old daughter insisted I get going on Instagram. So if you have an Instagram account, I just started posting a picture every single day. So that uh, that it, it's going to be a lot of work, but I've, I've done it for three weeks. Okay, so I got a hundred or two hundred followers, and so that's uh, pretty pretty fun. So that that gives you an idea of what uh, we were using for that. Um, if we want to perhaps uh, uh, let's see if we can if we can open up the dome in, uh, there perhaps uh, you can see that this is a kind of a live shot of uh, of what we're uh, seeing in the desert there and um, if we this is how we actually open the dome I hit 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 open the roof open the roof now I will share with you the uh, the live shot excuse me the live shot of the uh, there we go let's uh, let's let's look at the live shot of the roof opening there can you see that yes we can and should I make it bigger screen or is it good just like that uh, you can make it bigger actually if possible yeah how about perfect. that perfect so that is live shot of the roof opening. It is uh, in New Mexico. It is on mountain time. So the sun is still up, but it's really close to uh, sunset. Sunset's in about 15 minutes. You can see there's some clouds out there today, but um, 
It, it should be a good night tonight. I was actually planning on taking some images of uh, 4565, NGC 4565, which is that really good long um, that, that uh, edge on galaxy. That was a weird uh, thing that just happened to the screen, wasn't it? I think a spider walked in front of it. I think that was exactly right. <laughs> I think that was a spider. You see the see the the shadow on the right. The the uh, the roof goes a full forty feet out. Uh, it goes beyond the end because we wanted it to have a really good uh, west horizon. So we have a really good west horizon. But that's that's basically what you see. And I use the sky program, and uh, and it and that's how we uh, get the uh, the the um, scope to work and uh, I wanted to show you uh, perhaps this is other I have some other shots here we go um, you can see the dome kind of opening there And that is Clyde Tombaugh's personal telescope. So that just gives you an idea of what um, that. And when you have a a, a telescope that is that the um, it's remote control. You got to have really good pointing, and uh, the Sky program, as a lot of you know, um, and a lot of other programs will do this. They will uh, have to be calibrated, and this is the, during a calibration run. So it goes around and it takes a picture of 250 stars. So that gives you an idea of what um, what that looks like, and um, so. What I wanted to talk about now was uh, what did we do and how did we do it? So let me uh, pull up the actual, the final product. Let's go ahead and just go right to this. Unless there's any questions. I'll, I'll ask one question real quick. Do you, are you using a DSLR remotely? Yes. Interesting. Yeah, there's not many people who do that. Yeah, it's... I you probably just uh, power it on and off remotely, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it, it is it's quite reliable. And uh, I didn't really talk about um, um, I didn't really talk about uh, uh, my my own um, imaging philosophy. Um, yeah, here's here. This is you'll see the poster behind me here. Um, I'm the lazy astrophotographer. I. Uh, got started when digital cameras got good. I uh, I didn't really want to mess around with CCDs because CCD cameras back in the you know in the 90s were a lot of work and I was lazy so I only wanted to get going when it was easy so that's why I do the uh, DSLRs because it's one shot color and it's quicker and easier. I don't do any dithering, uh, don't do any filters uh, so you know, that's my that's my philosophy. Thank you. All right, going back to share the the full screen, and um, let's talk about the night. What we did. Um, As you can see, there you have a team of people here in the bottom left-hand corner. You can see that was Tony, Aaron, Nathan, me, Doug, and Stan. It, can you see that whole thing, Adam? Yes, I can. Okay. So we had uh, we got uh, the, this team of five people, and uh, we we uh, got a clear night, and uh, so there was really uh, two big jobs telescope operators and photoshoppers so that was the that was the whole uh, evening uh, the two 
people were uh, Nathan and Doug spent the whole night at the at this uh, computer that I'm sitting at right now running the telescope and basically that is uh, they had a list to go down and we uh, we we read Alex's article and I also was able to download a list of the Messier Marathon that came from the Phoenix Club. So the Phoenix Astronomy Club there, I think it's the Saguaro Club. Uh, they have a very nice sequential list of objects to look at. But as uh, people know who've got these uh, German equatorial mounts, is, uh, it's kind of a pain to cross from the east side to the west side of the sky. Crossing the meridian is kind of a pain when you have a, a, a telescope on a German equatorial. So we had to re redo the uh, the the uh, sequencing just a bit. But if you want to take a, a, a picture of all 110 in one night, you have six minutes per object. That's it. Six minutes per object. So we figured we were going to try to... Uh, go for maybe two minutes on bright objects or if it's a showpiece we'll spend up to five minutes so no none of the exposures exceeded five they were all in the two three or four minute range there was no stacking except for one of the images so they were just a single shot so while the two folks uh, Nathan and Doug were uh, were uh, running the telescope. Uh, Stan had set up an FTP site, so I could quickly grab the images from New Mexico and pull them down onto my laptop in the next room. So I was pulling those down throughout the night and dropping them into what you see here. And what you see here is. Uh, the background is a Hubble picture. It's a Hubble shot of NGC 1300, I believe. And NGC 1300 is a barred spiral. And it has these just two big spiral arms. And I laid out the uh, objects, evens on one arm and odds on the other. So they they just go in order, and so uh, we we spent all night doing this, and uh, it took me another let's say what was it 12 hours after dawn, because I had to, I had some other family responsibilities and and I couldn't get back to it till the evening. But about 12 13 hours after dawn, I was able to uh, finish this, and uh, it was just a heck of a lot of fun. Um, we we went through a lot of Red Bull and coffee, um, and like I said, I'm I'm not young anymore, so it was not easy to stay up all night. But we had a team of people that we got all excited and we worked together. We kept each other awake, and uh, Doug and Nathan did a, a wonderful job, and uh, Stan got us started, and uh, Tony helped me with some Photoshop tricks, and Aaron worked until about 2 a.m. So it was truly a team effort. This is not, it's amazing, and Alex maybe can speak later. It's an amazing thing to do it himself, like he did. Uh, but um, it, it, it was just a really fun thing to do in one night. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, as maybe we'll zoom in and maybe take a look at this. And perhaps uh, if there's any questions, or I can tell some stories along the way. Ryan, Alex is asking if you did, if you used plate solving. No plate solving. No, the you saw that little video of the telescope zooming around and going around. I had, uh, you know, I, I had a 250 star model, pointing model, so the telescope pointed quite well. So we we didn't need much tweaking. Once you went to the object, uh, we needed to tweak maybe in 10 seconds, or it was right smack in the center. No need for any plate solve. Uh, that's the, when the sky works. It works great. And it's called the Sky X, you know, their program, which is what I use for for running the telescope. Which, you know, I can I can uh, pull that up right now here. Here, this is the program. What kind of, what kind of mount was it again? It's a it's a Paramount 
Okay. MX. Paramount MX. Okay, so it was the it was the native software and everything running it. Did you um did you point take a test picture and then take your long picture or did you um did you just assume that it was going to be there? That's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it, um, you know what? We started to do some test shots, like you know, five second test shots, and but then after a few, we realized, hey, it's it's going well. Let's just go. Let's just uh, you know, let's just go for the two minute or the four minute shot. But uh, you most of the time we would do some test shots, maybe just five seconds or whatever, and. Uh, and, and as a lot of people know, when you do this type of thing, the focus changes throughout the night because uh, it gets colder in the desert and the focus changes. So we had to refocus uh, probably every two hours. But this is the program, and uh, all you do is you just type in, you know, like M77, hit fine, and hit slew, and then the telescope will move to M77. What is very, what I found is extremely valuable in in this uh, for 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 having a remote control telescope is this having a picture to be able to watch it and even better to listen you got to be able to hear it and you really want to hear it move or if there's anything that malfunctions you want to know and so. Uh, we found that it's just very useful to uh, have this camera, this webcam, up and running at all times. And it has a super sensitive microphone. It, it's basically a baby cam. You know, this is a drop cam. Highly recommend it. The drop cam has been a wonderful, this is a wonderful uh, product. And, and uh, it's got a super sensitive microphone. So it really, you can hear, you can even hear the shutter going inside that silver box. So it's wonderful to have that, uh, that, 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 uh, the, the sound. So we really needed the sound as we went through the night. But uh, the, the Sky program really was our planetarium program, and this was our desktop. This is how you drive. So the telescope operators were watching this all night. But uh, th th another point to, to make is that this program is just used to point the telescope and say go. To, tr to control the camera we got to use something else and we used Backyard EOS and uh, that is a great program and uh, it's a nice simple program and like I said I'm the lazy astrophotographer so I'm lazy I like the simple and, and, and uh, quick programs. I, I take it what you did then was you decided whether you would go with the shorter exposure. The lo you said you went longer exposures on the really cool objects that could handle it, and so you would just change the exposure and the title on the backyard EOS and let it rip, right? Exactly. That's exactly what we would do, and uh, and that program is pretty easy to operate, mm -hmm. and uh, and and so yes. Um, what uh, were the um, ISOs? The IS, that's another good question. The ISOs went from, um, well, generally, I think we just, we left the ISO on um, 3200, I believe. It was either 1600 or 3200. And I'm, I'm opening up, this is the computer that controls the telescope in New Mexico, right here. So it's you know, it's pulling up my backyard EOS program, and so this is the program you use to control the camera, and uh, it's very simple. And you can set the uh, you can set things. Um, let's see. and another thing, if you are doing a remote control um, situation, you have to have a remote control uh, uh, switches. The, uh, basically, it's a uh, multiple outlet switches. As you can see, I have not changed the password. So it gives me this nasty message every time. But if I were to turn on everything right now, let's just turn everything on. This is how I would start my evening. I would turn everything on, and I have a couple focusers, and I have a fan. But the last thing, as you can see, is my Canon. I'll turn that on. 
and hopefully if the USB is working properly it will allow us to connect there you go so this is the camera is on and you can select the ISO right here you can actually crank up what I like to do is I'll crank up the ISO to 12,800 and then just take a five second picture just to make sure that galaxy is in the center and you push capture boom there it is wonderful simple program Brian two questions just came in and one of them I think you just answered what do you use to see the live view of the MK3 and I'm gonna guess that's backyard EOS live view yes uh, from Tom G I, I don't know uh, Tom, if you're familiar with the program, but if he were to click frame and focus, he'd pretty much see the live view that's coming off the camera. Exactly. This is the live view. And actually, look, if you can, I don't know if you can see the detail, but you see this cloud moving mm -hmm. from the upper right-hand corner? <laughs> Isn't that funny? That's a live shot of uh, looking over the mountain straight south, and there's a cloud moving probably from east to west. And uh, Dylan is asking a question about observatories and uh, ballpark cost for shed construction and automation, not including the scopes. Great yeah. question. Yes, it, it does vary. Um, at the top is your, your Sierra remote observatories and New Mexico skies and those people, and they will uh, do everything for you. They will set up and have a dome, have a, a shed for you, and then you just bring your telescope, and they will host it and do all the... do, do all and have the Internet, and they'll be on-site tech support and all that. And as I understand, I think that is something like 1500 a month. So th that that gets to be a lot of money very quickly. Um, this, uh, if if you want to set up a uh, uh, just a shed and have all the hookups, I believe um, the company that made this is Backyard Observatories. So um, they're the folks to find out the exact cost. Backyard Observatories, and and uh, it would be tough for me to estimate, but uh, I guess. My, the one we have, as you can see, is huge, right? I, the one we have is got three telescopes. It's got room for four. It's 20 feet by 40 feet. So that roof is monstrous. And so uh, the other people around us have a more more uh, reasonable, and it's more like a, a 10 by 15. And uh, something like that is, I would guess, would be about $15,000 to uh, to get up and running not including any telescope or any mount or anything like that but again I'm 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 not up on the exact cost for a single telescope observatory Brian it's probably also not including the land no that that's correct and and th this situation that we are in it Rancho Hidalgo um, it is a unique situation because Gene our landlord the developer he uh, helps uh, he's in charge of the construction and it's a 10-year lease so we we uh, actually do not own the building uh, we do help support the purchase of it but um, there uh, he, he gives a 10-year lease with with a renewal after that 10 years for you know another 10 years to make it 20 years and so that is the that's the situation that we're in so uh, it's a little more reasonable but at Rancho Hidalgo um, it requires the owners to do a little bit more work it's in order to reduce the costs uh, it's kind of a little more of a do-it-yourself uh, situation so I've Dylan, Dylan had, I, uh, I'm just answering Dylan's question here about how much does it cost for shed construction and automation we've got uh, 18 observatories all 10 by 12 roll-off roofs all pretty much single scope observatories and uh, we're running right now at about 5,500 to 7,000 not counting the automation switches that um, you may have to add some of the people do have automation switches and stuff like that but it costs about 5,500 to 7,000 it can vary dramatically according to how much you're willing to do yourself rather than have somebody else have a contractor come in and and do it but um, we generally have a local worker come out that we pay, you know, a certain cut 
uh, hourly rate and stuff like that to assist. Some of the guys build their own of the 18 that have been built. But in, in answer to your question, that's what it costs. But remember, you have to have a land for it. You have to have um, internet connection. And particularly if you're going remote, you might want to have somebody in the neighborhood that can go out there and untangle that USB cord. Definitely. I, uh, there, there, I, there have been so many issues that have come up. And if we didn't have somebody there, we would be sunk. And, uh, and Brian, that brings up a question from Sean. What, you remember when you said, okay, now if the USB connects, we should be able to, oh, there it is. Well, what happens if the USB won't connect? That's a good question. There are times when I'm trying to get things up and running and it won't connect or the, uh, the, the mount won't connect or some other glitch is happening. I, when I'm there, I feel like I'm at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory driving a rover on Mars and I'm stuck in the dirt. It is, it is, it is uh, at first, it's extremely scary. But you know what? Now it's kind of exhilarating because there are many ways to work around things. Uh, I, I have ability to turn thing each each thing. I can turn it on and off. Okay, so I can turn things on and off. I can uh, uh, I can delete or I can uh, I can uh, disable a USB device, then enable it. All right, that's another trick. And if none of this works, reboot. So there are uh, several things you can do, and, uh, and I, it's amazing. I have found that 80% uh, of the time, I can make it work. It just takes a little time. So uh, that's it, 80% of the time. Now, uh, we had lightning fry my circuit board. The circuit board got fried from lightning not only in my PC, but in that red paramount mount that you see out there, and also the USB hub that's also on the telescope tube. So in that situation, I was uh, I was down. I was I was uh, it was bad, and um, but luckily we found out that uh, some, the person on site said, "Hey, you got a Dell computer with on-site warranty," and the gentleman drove uh, 200 miles and put in a new motherboard in my Dell and it was free. But, uh, How often do you go out to visit your observatory? Well, the, the, I do go out to fix stuff, to be honest. So I'm, I'm usually going out to fix stuff and I'm going out, but uh, if it's in winter, I want to go out because I live in Michigan and Michigan in winters are really not very nice. So it's great to go out here in the winter. So I end up going, it's only been, uh, what, 15 months since we started. So I installed in February of last year. Uh, and so total, I think I've taken four trips. Four trips in 15 months, but uh, the first two or three were just making sure everything's up and running. And uh, I've been very fortunate. Everything has run great, but we have Gene there in case something goes wrong. Do you see that yellow cable right there? that yellow cable on the telescope to fell out the back and uh, it needed to be put back in and so um, uh, he knew he knew where the duct tape was and he duct taped it on and the other people who have observatories we uh, look out for each other we have a Yahoo group and uh, we tell each other when we're gonna be there and uh, we do simple things I went to another gentleman's observatory and and helped uh, work on his webcam. Any other questions? Do you have surge suppressors, surge suppressors installed? Um, well, since the lightning hit, yeah, yeah, we, we're starting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we're working on that. Yes, we've gotten more surge suppressors and uh, and um, uh, grounding. In fact, uh, that's really a topic going on right now because if you know anything about the desert, we have the monsoons coming in uh, July, August. We have the, uh, the the thunderstorms and the lightning storms that seem to roll through every day, 
and uh, so everybody is a little worried about that because of the lightning strike last summer so people are putting in their surge suppressors right now looking making sure their grounding is good we put in an optical cable that's not copper to bring in the internet and that was one improvement uh, but uh, yeah we, we need to uh, really make sure that things are protected uh, but Stan and I are actually considering shutting down everything, unplugging everything for July and August. Uh, number one, for safety. Number two, uh, there's a lot. There are not many good nights in that two-month period that we would miss, and uh, we're thinking of doing that to make it uh, safer. Are you powering off AC? Yes, we we would we would unplug everything. AC, really, the the key is the two things coming into the building are AC and internet, and we would unplug both those. Yeah, because you could do a battery bank. That's something I've been thinking about. And they don't have to worry about lightning, apparently. Yes, yes, uh, but you still want to have uh, you know a, a a lightning rod or something because it's it's because ama it's amazing to watch those elect electrical storms down there and. Uh, uh, they're going to hit even if it's not even if they're going to hit the lo the tallest thing around, right? Mm -hmm. So you got to be careful and and being off the grid is is helpful, but it will it's not going to going to make you uh, immune from lightning strikes. Which which leads to the next question: Off the grid, how do you get USB or excuse me? How do you get internet out there? Ah, that's a good question. We are fortunate that we are close to a fiber optic line. So we've got good internet and uh, very good internet, and so. But we have uh, now, as it grow, the place grows. We we do have a, a lot of people splitting off and putting in routers. And uh, to be honest, we've had some issues with people not coordinating static IPs and things like that. And we've had conflicts and uh, uh, internet not working for somebody because somebody just came along and plugged in willy nilly. So uh, we're working on being more uh, diligent, more disciplined as far as our, our use of routers. But uh, we're lucky we have uh, fiber optics. But I will say that we do have a backup system here. Uh, at, our, at this observatory here, we have a Hughes dish. So we do have the Hughes satellite internet dish. Uh, and that is for emergencies. For example, if the internet goes down, a storm is coming, we can close the roof. Uh, but Hughes is painfully slow, and you really can't take any pictures running on Hughes. Are you using uh, remote monitoring of computers that are on site, or are you remotely running the devices? Uh, a good question. Um, yes. The, um, we have a computer room that's beyond the wall here on the right, and in that computer room are uh, three computers, one for each telescope. So I have a telescope. I have a can. I have a Dell computer that is sitting there in the next room, next to the telescope, that runs that telescope. In right. fact, that's what we were. That that's this right here. This one right here, this computer right here, this we're looking at the desktop of the Dell machine that had the fried motherboard that is sitting there in New Mexico. And then so you, you really don't have as much demand as some people might think to, to do things in real time because you, uh, you're just monitoring what's happening there rather than trying to run it from far away. Exactly. Yes, you you don't want to have to do much over the pipe or over the internet. So I'm running this Team Viewer program, which is fantastic. But other people will use Remote Desktop or these other programs. But it is amazing how well this Team Viewer works. And so then I will just—it's almost like I'm there. Tell us about your processing of the images when you took 110 in one night. Okay. That's a great question. So, um, like I said, uh, the operators would take the pictures. They were taking about one picture every six minutes. And as the pictures got taken, they got put in a folder 
on my machine there in, in New Mexico, and then we had an FTP set up uh, on a little uh, Arduino computer, I believe, or a little Lenovo. Anyhow, I was able to FTP and go grab um, those images and bring them onto my laptop, and uh, it was a pretty simple process in the laptop. Um, the first step is uh, it's a Canon RAW image, and uh, then I would use uh, uh, Photoshop to um, bring it into Photoshop, and then I would just uh, tweak the the dark levels and the white levels and a little bit of curves, and not much more. I only had you know maybe ten minutes to play with each image, so uh, I didn't do a whole lot. Like I said, there's no stacking. These pictures are these pictures are not stacked. Well, part of your goal was to get this produced within 24 hours, right? Well, I was hoping to actually get it produced at dawn. Oh, real time. Huh? <laughs> yeah, but but we had we had a, a team member that fell ill, and other people well, couldn't come. On, get a new one. <laughs> <laughs> so it, we couldn't really get it done as fast as we want, but. Uh, now we can maybe zoom in. You can see that um, it, we were just astounded that that you can get this level of quality with one image, one five-minute image. Look at look at the lagoon there. That's a that's a nice. This, this is a, one, a single image, five minutes. Did you did you uh, take them at uh, full resolution? Yes, yes, full can Canon camera raw resolution. Yes. So each file was about. Uh, 20 megabytes. Uh. And uh, yeah, so that, that is a. Uh, if we didn't have the FTP site, we couldn't have brought things home over the internet fast enough to do the work. Yeah. Which southern objects are the uh, shortest lived, so to speak, in the night? Well, that, that's a good question. Um, when you get started on a Messier marathon, you always have trouble with uh, Andromeda and M33, right? It's 31 and 33 are setting in the west right as you as, as the evening starts. So you can see, look at, there's my image of M31, and look at, we got an airplane going through, going to Phoenix. <laughs> see that? So there's that. And so, um, and look at my processing is pretty poor on that. It's brown, isn't it? You know, I couldn't go to per, go for perfection here. You just had to go. But uh, M31 is setting in the west right, at, right as twilight is ending. M33, same story. Very hard to catch those. Uh, so the the uh, the stressful part about a m imaging or a visual uh, Messier marathon, and I've done many uh, uh, visuals, is the the beginning and the end. The beginning is hard. The end is hard. In Let's the middle. See M30. Let's see M30. Okay, now the M30. So we we have an expert asking this question because M30 was a nightmare. The day before, the day before, I figured out that M30 was going to be uh, hitting the building. I mean, I, it, it's behind the building, the edge of my roof, and I realized that I only had maybe one minute to catch it before it uh, before the twilight got high. And there's M30. <laughs> That is the worst image I've ever taken of anything, I think. But we got it. And yeah. th this was taken when M30 was about two degrees above the horizon. And I, th and I think you can see, can you see that the, that the left side of this image is different than the right? Mm-hmm. Yep. I think that's the roof. Yours is better than mine, I think. But that's the roof. I, yeah. The roof was was obstructing half the telescope, so we had such a bad time. We could only take um, we were just taking uh, like uh, thirty second exposures, and I think I stacked three of them. So this is the only stacked picture in the whole poster, but this one had to be stacked because of uh, because it was just uh, so bad. But we got all 110. I mean, I haven't even come close to that visually. The best I ever did was 100 before. And there's M40, right? That's a <laughs> that's, that's a waste of time. That's a pretty crappy Messier object. Um, 
I just want to go out to one of the spiral arms here to, to show you some of the stuff down here. M83, that's pretty darn good for five minutes. M81, you can see the uh, arms. 77, oh, isn't that one a toughie? I think that's a toughie at the very beginning of the night. As you can see, it's very very bright twilight. So that was a, that one was a real hard one. Uh, at the beginning of the night, you got to go boom, boom, boom. So what we did at the beginning is we we did short exposures. So this was probably one minute. We didn't really go more than one or two minutes to start the evening, or to end in the morning. And is is 63 the sunflower? Yep, I think that's it. And um, that one's pretty good. So you can see, I, I laid out these, as I said, odds on one arm and evens on the other. And you can kind of go up. The owl, that's pretty good. You can see the eyes. The owl's very good. Yeah, the owl's, yeah, I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty good for, and you can see my tracking, okay? We we tried to use auto guiding, and we, we did auto guiding for a lot of these. Um, you know, I use PhD guide with that star shoot auto guider. It works great, and um, and sometimes we would guide, but sometimes the guys uh, uh, they were in a hurry or they forgot or you know something happened, and and, and so this one probably was not auto guided. Um, now uh, that my club here in Ann Arbor was was very excited to hear about this, so they um, they asked if I was going to print up copies. And Aaron, one of our uh, team members, is a professor at Eastern Michigan University. So we just printed uh, uh, about 15 of these posters. Not the full 70-inch wide ones. Uh, we 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 have the the, the full size is uh, 70 inches wide and 42 inches tall, and we printed like five of those, and people took those, and then we also printed them uh, the other way. You know, so the the uh, uh, width is 41 and the height is about 23, and we printed like a dozen of those, and and uh, they they all sold. We we sold them at cost. And uh, so we, we, we weren't making any money. We just sold them at the price that the, they print them at the university print shop. And, yeah, now we got like five people emailed me and said, oh, are they gone? I want another one. So I, I have to do another printing. Let's look at the sombrero. That was pretty good, too. Brian, should some other people contact you if they're interested in your poster? Yeah, but I can't probably do it as cheap because then I have to I, I have to do some shipping. But they can email me. Um, do do we want to put up my email address? No, you know what? Contact me through the site. Yeah. Uh, or Brian's on Cloudy Nights as well. I think your screen name is Brian Odom, right? I think so. On yes, Cloudy Nights. On Cloudy Nights. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but yeah, I would just it would be cost a bit more because I have to. Uh, to go get a, a ship, some shipping tubes, you know, and that type of thing. But um, it was it was really fun, and um, and uh, I don't know if we do it again because uh, you know once you've done it, what what's more to do? We, but uh, the, we, at the end of the evening, one of the guys said, "Hey, okay, next year we're going to do the Hers the Herschel 400." No, that w that was a joke. Yeah, can't do the NGC. No. No, this is uh, this is. I mean, this was a huge night. I can't believe I actually stayed up all night. Actually, I had had so much caffeine that um, I, at about 9 a.m. I I, I got a glass of wine so I could go to sleep. You know, you had to stay up an extra hour too because you were like an hour off. You're you're central and they're mountain. exactly two hours. I'm two hours you're different. Two so hours? Yeah. yeah, so it was it was after 9 a.m. that that it finally uh, the, the we shut down. Hmm. I was in sleepy land by seven. Well, it's uh, it's a it's a it's a it's an athletic event, or it is a physical event. Trying to stay up all night and and to do this type of thing because it's amazing. Like at four a.m., what mistakes you start to make. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
not knowing if you uh, did, did, did we really do that one or did we do just check it off accidentally or something? It, and the bad part is you can't go back and check because you're already on the next object. Exactly, and so I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm not able to show it, but we had a check. Uh, I had a, a check sheet. I basically had a list of that that um, Phoenix Club list, and uh, two days before, I listed out kind of a rough schedule as for when they should, when we should start each one, and had a checkbox. You know, did you do it or didn't you? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Are there any other questions out there? Has everybody got their questions in, uh, either in Q&A or in comments? I haven't seen any more in Q&A, but guys, please ask them. Now's your chance. I'm, like, really impressed because I'll tell you, I've considered trying this, and I was discouraged when I heard Sequence Generator Pro wouldn't let you generate a sequence with 110 targets in it. Uh, you did this all manually. You did this all target one, take the photo. I mean, that's the most impressive thing. That really is a marathon. Well, it really did require uh, planning the day a couple days before, uh, uh, printing out, uh, you know, reading Alex's article, and then printing out the, the list from the Phoenix Club because they had a nice checklist, and then just going through it with pencil and penciling in times, and then getting out the eraser and realizing, oh, that's too slow. I need to go faster. Yeah. And, and so uh, I had to go over, like, you know, it took me probably four hours of plan of the timeline planning, at least four hours of, of planning just to say, okay, this is doable. That's probably why you succeeded, because I could easily see anybody trying this and coming up 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 objects short. But actually, getting every single one six minutes per object isn't a lot. No, no, there's no time for screwing up. And 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 I, it was amazing that the 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 USB gods were smiling on us that night, and we didn't have any you know one of those 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 failures that that pop up and suddenly the camera is no longer visible. You you've lost your camera. Or yeah, I think we did have early in the evening though. Uh, we did have a glitch where. Uh, you know, it wasn't slewing. The telescope wasn't moving, and we had to restart the Sky X, and then everything was fine after that. Yeah, I was gonna just say right before this, I was getting my stuff going, and I had to restart my computer, and that would be a deal breaker in something like this. But I guess maybe you get one. Yeah, you do. Yeah, we had uh, a few. We had, there was a number of screw ups, and uh, but but there's there's slack in the timeline. There's time. Uh, there's usually, especially come uh, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. You have time to uh, to take a break. Um, there things aren't coming as fast as uh, as you know. So you can take a break. But what we were trying to do is uh, lengthen the exposures. Then you know, go the full five minutes. Then. And Frank's asking your your plan was based on rise and set, so that was his question. Yeah, rise and set. Basically, uh, in in I in in pencil, I wrote in um, what the altitude was for each object, as you know, in the beginning and the end of the night, and that's where it got scary, and that's why um, you know this 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 horrible one here, it was it was only two degrees up in the horizon, just over the distant mountain. I can't remember exactly, but I think that my penultimate object, the one before M30, between that and M30 was something like 20 minutes before it got up high. Before M30 got up high enough for me to get that last one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And see, you're 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 playing a game. Let's say you, uh, uh, I want to wait until it's high, but then the sun's coming up, and you you you're gone past astronomical twilight. And now you you're in, you're you don't have a choice on rise and set time. It's as soon as it gets dark, you have to start taking pictures. Exactly. Uh, and if anybody wants to do this, I would strongly suggest that you don't start on them. What is it, 74 or 31? Yes. Whatever it is over there. I'd suggest you not start on them. Start on M42, where the sky's already dark and you know where you're pointing. Yes. Then go to M45. Yes. Get two of them out of the way before it's even dark enough over there to capture the oh, ones on the horizon. That's a really good, a really good suggestion. Would anybody like to see the six-minute presentation I did on my whatchamacall? I hate to 
steal any thunder. No, no, I'm I I am happy to yield the floor. Okay, well let me. This isn't exactly yielding the floor, but let me go to screen share here, uh, entire screen, and um, then I go to I think here. <gasps> Son of a gun! It's all ready to go. <laughs> SCA Mania, 110 mediocre deep space images in one stressful night. Click, click, click. There's some music that goes along with this, but I don't think you guys will see it. Are you seeing the... No, um, no I still see uh, your avatar talking. I don't see your screen. Okay, hang on a minute. Let me go back to... You know what is cool oh, is here we go. I forgot to click share. Alex, your your telescope was very similar to the what I used, right? Well, uh, I used a Mead. Um, um, now, now do you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Um, go, hey, go, Mister. Where's my Where's my on switch here? There we go. Now you're seeing it. Uh, now I see your whole powerful. There you go. Yep. Okay. Uh, I used a me 10 inch f4.5 that I bought in 1995, and um, it's on. It was on an AP 1200, and on top of that, I had mounted a. Um, uh, I was using a QSI 583 on the on the 10 inch f4.5, and uh, then I I mounted a TV 85 with the DSLR on top. I also, for most of these, like that's a DSLR shot, but, but as you see here, some of these objects are taken in twilight, so you're not going to get much. See the times there as far as how long things take? You only have just that much time in order to get things. Up in the big screen there, the big thing is all the different objects taken all night, uh, and then this other stuff around the edges is just explanation of what's happening, and I don't really need to talk. You guys can read most of that stuff. And there's some funky music going on in the background, which you guys aren't going to hear. So, so you wouldn't be shown in normal deep space imaging. Um, don't really show up too much here because you're taking them in very slow, small places and you don't have a chance to screw up. See all these pictures over on the side? I would have thrown those out, obviously. But I can't. They're my pictures. Neither was there a question I talked you, over? You did this around March? Uh, yeah. You have to do them, I think, in the Northern Hemisphere. Although, you should note that you can do 80% of the Messier objects almost any night. Almost any clear night. You can do 80%. All of my images are, well, there's, some of them were DSLRs, but um, the big wide fields, I needed the DSLR. Um, uh, but all of them are uh, LRGB stacked. I actually pulled 400 and some images into Maxim all at the same time and told them, go process it. And it sorted out which one belonged to which and all that other stuff and um, gave me these pictures. Yeah, and Samira is asking how you decided the order for the objects, when to shoot which objects, and I think that's kind of what we were saying. Yeah, um, there are a number of published lists that, uh, you know, how to do a Messier um, marathon, and they're basically pretty much the same, except that they're optimized for doing, um, for your location, and they're optimized for, um, uh, if you've got a DAV, you go one way. If you've got a, um, a motorized scope, you can go a different way. Uh, because when you got a DAV, you want to, you know, like in the in the um, um, uh, Virgo cluster, visually, you're gonna you're gonna want to go from one to the other, uh, actually galaxy hopping rather than star hopping. Um, but um, it, when you're um, when you're doing it photographically with the German equatorial mount, as Brian pointed out, you don't want to be flipping back and forth. So what's a good idea is to keep taking all your images based on one of those, um, uh, one of those things, uh, one of those lists that you can find in various places. Image away, and then when you get up near the um, meridian, completely flip about 30 degrees into the eastern sky. 
and take images over there for an hour or so until you're about to uh, get to the meridian again and then flip back and get all those that you didn't cover in the first place and then when you've gotten them and you're all caught up flip over again and you'll stay in the eastern sky the rest of the night in other words you've only done three meridian flips if you follow the typical daub list you're going to do dozens of meridian flips because that's the way it's going to be um, so just think of that okay Yeah, I think that I did uh, just uh, three flips, just like you said. Okay. Did you take uh, simultaneous images ever uh, with both cameras or just yes. one? Yes, yes, for the big objects, uh, M31, 110, and, thir and 30, 32, I think, uh, and um, 65, 66. Um, you can see uh, something like here's one DSLR M17 DSLR. Yeah, I was taking the pictures with the uh, big newt and the uh, TV85 up on top at the same time. All of them that don't say DSLR were taken LRGB with the QSI583 and um, that kind of stuff. Okay. Oh, Samir has a tough question here. Do you have to be in a dark sky site, or can the Messier Marathon be attempted from a suburban or urban site? Uh, for imaging, well, here's, a, here's an important thing here, guys. This is one of the reasons your, your objects are so poopy. See that last object, 8.3 degrees above the horizon when I got it? See, M30? Yeah, it's officially there. I got it. But it's ugly. It's uglier than yours, Brian. But you <laughs> I don't know. You more than 5.6 air masses to see it. And there's all sorts of bad stuff, including, again, the roof, not the roof, but the wall of my observatory. Um, now, I'm sorry, can, can you do a Messier Marathon? That depends. Um, uh, there's my last object there. I think you probably could do a bunch of them. Um, you just couldn't, uh, you couldn't see very well. I mean, uh, Messier was doing it with a three or four inch refractor in the olden days. And I'm not sure that the skies were all that much better since they cooked with coal and stuff like that back then. So, um, so there. That's my version of it. Let me get out of here. How do I get out of here? Okay, I'm finished. I'm showing off. Stop. Yeah. My Two people in the room have who've done the Messier marathon in one night, imaging, which is uh, there can't be that many people in the world that have done it. When um, I I first wrote an article for my club newsletter, we've got a very interesting club newsletter, about forty pages long each month, and I so I wrote an article for that, and then I sent it in to Sky and Tell, and uh, they rejected it, of course, because. You know, because that's life. And but later on, uh, they contacted me again and said, "Yeah, yeah, maybe we'd be interested in it." And um, uh, it was substantially altered by the time um, they finished with it, and probably for the better for the general population. Although all my little buddies' names that were in there in the original article didn't get in there for some silly reason. But back to your question, one of the things they um, they told me about was that oh gosh, back in was it 93 or something? They had attempted this and had gotten a lot of objects. They're up in the, uh, I'm maybe all the way up to 100 and something. And I've, I've had a buddy, I've had buddies that have gotten close. I don't know that I've, I've gotten anybody that's taken full color all 110. I'm not saying that that was the first time it's ever happened or Brian's was the second or anything like that. I'm just saying, I haven't been contacted or ever gotten any information that other people have done it, and I, I, I just can't believe I'd be the first person ever to do it. You know, it just, just doesn't happen that way. So, you know, it almost wouldn't surprise me because it's really difficult, and the equipment that lets you do it has only been around for so long. Um, although I guess Brian's not using plate solving. Alex, you weren't using plate solving, were you? Yes, I, I would. Well, I would. I would plate solve every so often, just to make. Well, 
you know, if I were having a problem, I would plate solve after a, a meridian flip mm -hmm. um, and stuff like that. Now, some of you may be asking, why did you use a QSI and have to take four pictures, you know, L, R, G, B? First off, why take the L? Why not just go with R, G, B? Not because I'm stupid. You know, I didn't know what I was doing really. Now, and the other big problem, I would have used one of my DSLRs, except that I couldn't get Maxim to reliably communicate with my DSLRs. And uh, at that point, you know, I'm, I'm not going to take the chance. The other thing that I don't know, Brian, did you practice this at all, or was this just right out the gate? No, I, I was worried about the, the, the beginning and the end of the night. So, as you can see, I. I M74, this crappy, I did a crappy picture of that like two days before, and then the M30 at the end of the night. So I, di I did practice just the beginning and the end. That's okay. it. Well, what I did for like three or four months beforehand, every time I was out in the desert, um, these were all taken from the Desert Observatory, I would actually take my list and I would, I would go through as many of them as I could and you know refine it we get my process down a little bit better and uh, just keep keep going after it as a matter of fact the results you just saw were from a Wednesday night the marathon was scheduled for Saturday night and so I I was gonna go do some uh, time-lapse photography down in Joshua Tree uh, with some other guys on Thursday um, yeah, on Thursday night. So on Wednesday night, I went out there and said, okay, this is one last practice run to see how I can do. And I was doing really good. And I said, oh, why is this a practice run? And I just kept going. And uh, that, so that was a practice run you just saw. The guys that showed up for Saturday night to do the same kind of thing, because like I said, we got 18 observatories out there and many people are imagers. Um, those guys uh, got... Uh, I know Norm got about 45 into it, and he was doing fine, and then the clouds came in. That's one thing we haven't even talked about, is that you could be going along, cruising along just fine, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, here comes a cloud, and that could screw things up dramatically. So, um, anyway, practice, yeah. practice, practice. I had to actually have a list to practice with the whole time. Yeah, there's yeah, some coordination. Yeah. There's some techniques. One of the one of the things I kept doing wrong was, I would write a message. My, my process was was writing the note that of the time I took the picture, changing the title on the file I was about to save to the object number, and then hitting go start the picture. The problem was that sometimes I would miscoordinate that. So I had several editions of. Uh, I don't know, M1 something, you know, 105 or something like that. I had several copies of all files all named M105. And what had happened was that I had taken different pictures, but I, I didn't change the file names. And that was a little confusing for me. Luckily, Maxim sorted it all out, and of course, I was able to figure out which one was which later. That, that same thing happened to us. The telescope operators forgot to change the name as they went from two additional objects. So I was downloading, and I was looking at this thing. Well, wait, wait, wait. What's what's going on? I have like three three images of, of M90. What's that? And then they came in from the other room saying, "Oh, oh, we just uh, here you go." And they they kind of steered me right. But you don't know that when 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 you see you're actually looking at all your images and you're you've got separate guys. To, when I was doing it by myself, I didn't have time to go back and check to see what the picture was. Wow! Uh, because I was already taking the next picture, and so I didn't know if I had done them all 110 until I was all finished. And a year and a half later, you know that picture I showed you on the wall? That's actually not my final picture, my final collage, because one of the guys in my club um, came in. He says, oh, I want to see how you did M30, M30. I want to see M30. So I said, okay, well, it's up there on the wall. You just go look it up. He says, I don't see M30. I looked, <laughs> oh, my God. Did I not do M30? I know I did M30. I know I, I know. I think it's got to be up there. And I went back and like, yeah, it was there. I just hadn't put it into my collage. And so that was kind of weird. That was a weird feeling. Yeah, I, I did the same thing. <laughs> okay. Yeah, somebody was looking at it. a guy was looking at it. Goes, oh, this is great, and uh, then he says, you, we're, we're, you forgot one, and I did. <laughs> so you gotta go squeeze it in along some spiral arm, huh? 
Yeah, I did. I had to rearrange and put it in. It was it was during the next, you know, within that 12-hour window after after dawn. Wow. Well, that's that. Yeah, very important to know your equipment, to be comfortable with it, to practice. It's just like anything else. You, this one's a toughie, and you got to be totally ready uh, for any contingency. Just reading through the questions, guys. If you have any more, ask them now. Um, Tom G is saying he's aspiring towards doing 110 objects. I could easily see someone coming out with 70... 80, but I don't know. I haven't had 110 sessions go right for me in a row, so that, that's the way I, I look at it. Yeah, that's what makes Ted Williams so amazing. That's what you know makes um, Don Drysdale, Oral Hershiser. It's not just that they got 56 scoreless innings, but that they ran them in a row. You know, um, that, they were you know 54 hitting games or hitting a, a game hitting streak. It's that you got them in a row. You didn't make one of them without a hit. That's that's the weird part. Yep. All right. Well, uh, guys, continue asking your questions. Brian, do you have anything else uh, you were going to go over? Is that? No, I was just looking at my camera. I uh, it it looks like it might be uh, puffy clouds, but maybe a good imaging night tonight. Um. But uh, I will tell you that, that this, this Astro Imaging channel has been so good for, uh, to open my eyes up to uh, things. Uh, for example, the, uh, the gentleman who was the developer of PhD2 gave me two really good pointers that night on how to use PhD2 guiding, and I've used that. Also, the sequence generator guys um, got me thinking maybe I should uh, give that program a try. So... Um, been very useful to, to listen to the various talks here uh, on these Sunday night sessions because I pick up stuff even when I don't think I'm going to pick up stuff. Yep, and Samir threw a quick question in. The DSLR, uh, did the battery last all night? And I'm guessing you're not using a battery. I'm guessing you're on AC. Exactly, yes. I, I am on AC. I have a little AC adapter thing, and um, and then, but I did have the cooler on because... Uh, my full frame DSLR heats up 20 degrees above ambient. Oh, that's bad. So uh, you got to have a cooler to take away that heat in the desert. All right, really impressive, uh, impressive feat, and uh, great presentation. Thank you, thank you, Brian, for coming by. It was a lot of fun. Um, one more question just po Oh, that was it. Okay. Well, yeah, thanks, guys, for coming. I do want to remind everybody, next week, uh, John Hayes is going to be on uh, discussing optical theory, and uh, it could be a, a really good episode. Uh, we'll definitely uh, let you know if you like your telescope without looking through it. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's the way I like to uh, think about it. But um, Adam, before yes. we sign off, could I say a couple things? Go right uh, ahead. Uh, one is, uh, if you are interested in nightscape photography, um, and we are going to have a uh, one of the TWAN, the World at Night Photographers, come out to our um, dark sky observing site in September, Dennis Mamana, and he's going to be giving a workshop um, at our facility out there. And if you've never been to our facility, um, I mean, it's got lots of cool stuff around that you've already heard about the observatories and the pads and all that other stuff. But it's also got beds and showers and bathrooms and desert scenery, and it's right near Joshua Tree National Park and stuff like that. Um, so you can come out and, and take our workshop September 12th if you're interested in that kind of photography at all. Dennis does a real good job with that kind of stuff. Um, also, next week is RTMC Astronomy Expo, and Craig Stark the developer of Nebulosity. Um, we're, we've, that's fuller than I thought it would be at this point, but the room can be expanded, and we're thinking of expanding the room. So if you want to come see Craig Stark, that'll be 50 bucks. Um, you get in touch with me either on, well, you, you, here probably or someplace. Um, 
So you're welcome to come out to that. And then uh, in November, Rogelio Bernal will be doing a workshop for us down in um, down in the desert, down in Anza Borrego, at nightfall. And all these things are something you you know if you can if you're at all close by or like to fly and like to drive, well, you come on out and visit with us. We sure would love to have you. That's Thank it, you, Alex. Um, what is is what's Rogelio's presentation or uh, uh, presentation on? Well, Rogelio will be coming to Nightfall, and that's uh we have a we take over an RV resort with a hotel in the desert down in Southern California desert, uh, Anza Perego. And uh, Rogelio will be there um, on the observing field, uh, you know, on the camera imaging field for, we're hoping at least a couple of nights. I haven't finished talking to him about that. but um, And then from uh, 10 o'clock in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday, he'll be giving a presentation, and we haven't nailed down exactly what he's talking about, but we know it's he's going to be presenting a lot of stuff about Pix Insight and uh, how he gets those big wide field mosaics and stuff like that. So we know that much. That's what that's what I would hope to see. Yeah. Um, well, you know that, and he'll be there. I mean, so you just say, "Hey, I want to know more about those." That's the cool thing about these workshops. You can just say, "Hey, I want to know more about this," and that's what they're there for. Yep. Okay. And I'm, something I've discovered is uh, pretty much all of every astrophotographer likes discussing astrophotography. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're not you're a pretty uh, close knit community. So you can ask anybody anything. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, if we don't have anything else, I see a few of our viewers are dropping out. We do have a lot of people in tonight. But uh, I do want to thank everyone for coming again next week. Optical Theory by John Hayes. Does anyone have anything for the public before we go? Speak now or forever hold your pieces. For those of you who are lurking out there and you think you could do a presentation, we are looking for presenters. Yep. Hey. Hey, Adam. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, Stephen wrote a comment on his image that he that we could share for him. I'm just oh, trying to find it now. Great, great. Uh, let me go find it. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not seeing it. Let me see. Where did he post it, Josh? I think he responded to it. I'm pulling it up right now. Here, I can read it for him. Yeah, if you don't mind, I don't see it. Steven said, first, he'd like to thank the other images that are submitting and that they are amazing. Uh, he really appreciates the fact of how much work and effort goes into acquiring and processing other deep sky object images. Um, his images of the sun shot in hydrogen alpha. He's been doing solar imaging for the past three years now. He says it's rather easy to do, but you need to sacrifice your arm and leg to afford the scope. <laughs> He's got a Lunt LS60 double stack solar scope. The camera is a DMK41 planetary cam made by the imaging source. The disk image is a six panel mosaic. He used the best 700 of 1,000 images per frame. The two close-ups of the active regions is the same setup, just two-time Barlow added into the imaging train. The video data was stacked using Astro Steckart, is that how you say it? And then later processed in Photoshop. He made it inverted to give it more of a dynamic look. The Photoshop processing included sharpening and denoising with a Photoshop plugin made by Topaz Labs. Then inverted and colored using clipping masks in Photoshop. As for displaying, I didn't want to do just three separate images, so I put them all together and added a drop shadow to show just exactly what you're looking at. Again, thanks for selecting my image, and sorry I couldn't make it. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, Stephen popped in, and I, I think he popped in a couple seconds too late, so we didn't get to uh, present on it. But thanks for submitting, Stephen. Great image. Um, two weeks, we have Stephen Ramsden coming on, who's a solar uh, imager extraordinaire. Uh, a lot of you probably know him. Maybe you've met him before because he's done more outreach than probably all of us combined. Uh, but uh, that is two weeks from now. Uh, but again, thanks for submitting. Thanks, Josh, for that. And uh, well, Pat, well, we got a question came in. What's Brian's night sky's name? Brian, do you have a? I, I don't know. 
Tom, is that about cloudy nights or, or what's that about? It says, what's Brian Night Sky's name? I think Night Sky it, Network, maybe? Are you on Night Sky Network, Brian? Um, I Yeah, I think so, but I haven't been on that for a long time. It's either my name or Dobsonian, D-O-B-S-O-N-I-O-N, -O -O Dobsonian. Uh, do you have a Cloudy Nights name? Besides, I think it's just your name, right? It's just my name? Yeah. Okay. Just saw that question come in late. Yep. Thanks, Alex. All right, guys. Um, have a good night. We'll see you next week. And uh, Brian Odom at, on Cloudy Nights, Footbag on Cloudy Nights, we're all on Cloudy Nights. So basically that's the best way to get us. Uh, thanks for coming out. Good night. <laughs>